And a welcome to the uh, course selection night. I'm used to walking around, but we're recording this, right? So I got to stay in one place, and uh, it will it will be put on the website just as a uh, not live streamed, thank God. And uh, uh, you'll be able to access it. That we'll also put the slides on there, on the on the uh, on the uh, website as well. Uh, I won't go through all the in detail over all the slides because we'd be here uh, till the cows come home. Uh, but I will hit on some major highlights that I think are important. We have a a small army of uh, staff here that to kind of supplement my message. So we have our uh, Ethan, Mr. Shoemaker, our vice principal, right, and Barb Stepkowski, who is going to uh, talk about. Uh, theater and the theater program, right? Because there's no business like show business, right? And Miss Cameron is our math department head. I'm going to try to stumble through about what I think about uh, 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 the uh, math program. And I, I, my vision of all this stuff is kind of very much focused on what can these courses do for students on their post-secondary path. And uh, their focus is more about the material, what they offer, and everything else, right? And I'm, I'm more about what can this course do for you. So it's good that they're here. And then we have Mr. Bao here, a import from Great Britain. Is this the first time you've been at a, a course selection evening, Mr. Bao? Yes. Yes, yes. So he is heading up, and he's part of a team that's offering some wonderful uh, programs at the school. And I could say it's now, what, two, three years, Glenn, that you're in here now? Uh, 18 months. 18 months, right? Uh, but the program is coming to life. And, uh, it's, it's, and uh, you know, I, I got kids talking about it. And uh, I will find kids doing their engineering work in my religion class, which is a good sign because that means they like it, right? They like it. So he'll talk about that today. So let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. St. Thomas More, blessed Edmund Rice, live Jesus in our hearts. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, Let's, uh, we're going to go through these slides. Some we'll spend more time on. Like I said, these slides will uh, be accessible on the school website. Uh, the sheet that you have here is something that all the uh, grade 10s uh, have received uh, through uh, Miss Chinapen. She actually talked to the grade 10s in religion classes. And it includes all the options that grade 10s have for course selection as grade 11s, right? And so we'll be working our way through this and uh, hopefully giving you some insights about how to plan things. Uh, there is a, a course selection handbook or work uh, 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 programming guide on our website. It's a huge document. It's a good 60 pages with detailed course descriptions of all the courses that we offer. Uh, some people like to read that stuff, right? and look at it to see what, what exactly we do cover. Again, my focus is what can you do with Chem 11, not what do you do in Chem 11, right? Subtle difference, but if you want to see that stuff, uh, it's certainly there. And this worksheet, of course, yes, it's on there as well. The slideshow, this will all be accessible. There are three of us uh, in the uh, department. Uh, Mr. Spangers, who was the good looking guy that, you, that welcomed you when you came in the door, uh, myself and, of course, Ms. DeWitt. And Ms. DeWitt is now in uh, Toronto, I believe. Uh, she's our librarian. She wears two hats like a lot of STM staff, staff do. And she's in Toronto. But she certainly has her fingerprints all over this uh, presentation. Uh, this is about easing the stress, right? Uh, I, 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 with your, your sons and daughters, especially the grade 11s that I spoke to, I went in real detail. Uh, 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 about courses and what works what and all that. And I'm not going to give that all to you guys. Uh, I think it wouldn't make what I think should be the goal of this night. And that is to ease your stress, to know that uh, it can seem rather daunting for some of you, or if it's the first student 
or a child that you've had go through this process, it, it can be pretty freaky. Uh, but the good thing is the people around here, the teachers and the academic counselors and the admin are not new to this process. Uh, so sometimes you got to trust us, right? If we try to explain everything in detail, that uh, can sometimes become a little cu uh, cumbersome. Uh, I think one thing, there are a few takeaways I want you to get on the night. The first thing is that STM students graduate. Uh, it's like a 99% graduation rate. I'm always asked by, will my son graduate? Will they have enough, or daughter, will they have enough credits to graduate? Uh, we make sure they do, right? So that's one thing I, I want to put you at ease. But of course, you pay tuition, you come to the school, not just for the religious background and everything else, but you want more options. And we uh, push your students, your sons and daughters, to achieve that. We'll talk more about that. Uh, but the majority of our students also move right into post-secondary. Uh, it's all about finding the right fit. And that is another takeaway I want you guys to have tonight. Uh, we'll talk about that too in a second. Uh, the course selection portal for Power School does not open until February 8th, and it closes on February 15th. So if you're looking to make choices after tonight, uh, you won't be uh, uh, able to access it. We certainly will be talking to uh, uh, or sending you out an email to say when the portal opens and how you access it. All students in grade 10 and 11 have now been spoken to. I've Actually, I've visited the grade 11s now twice. Uh, the academic counseling doors are also always open. You get people, kids coming in all the time. And of course, uh, our, uh, our, uh, these resources will be on the line and make use of our teachers. I tell the students all the time, if I'm looking at you as a math student, all I see is 82.3 as a GPA. They know you as a student. They know your work ethic. They know how strong you are, what you're capable of. They are the ones you got to ask for advice. I stress that all the time. You might want to push that one at home. I do want to just say a few things, right? Because, you know, a pressure mounts in grade 10, 11, and 12 about marks. And I want to get the story clean on here. Uh, you can tell your parent, or your, your sons or daughters, grade 10, 11, and 12 marks matter. But they aren't the be all and the end all. The grade 12 marks are. They matter for this. There is, a, there is a scholarship that, that's determined on your marks in the 80 credits required for graduation. And what they do at the end of their grade 12 year, they uh, uh, tally up all the GPAs of all the students in the province, and the top 8,000 8, uh, get $1,250. It's something you don't apply for. It's something that's totally GPA driven. Uh, but sometimes in grade 10, you know, students might find, oh, it's only grade 10. You know, I, I want them to know it does, it does matter. I'm not saying you lose sleep over this. You work. You just do your best. You don't slough things off. Because uh, it could, you know, sometimes in grade 12, they go, what was I thinking of in grade 10? I want them to realize that that's kind of important. Grade 10, 11, and 12 marks also appear on your permanent transcript. So when you're applying for scholarships or whatever after grade uh, after grade 12, uh, all those marks appear, right? So if you messed around with French 10, that baby's on there and, and it can't, it won't disappear. Again, not the end of the day, at the end of the world, but I think it does give us a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, ammunition to kind of say, hey, just work your hardest. You'll be okay. You'll find your right fit. Uh, there, there is uh, the, always, I'm always asked this, core uh, your grade 11 marks, universities do look at them. But it's still, by far, the most important are your grade 12. Your grade 12 are your most important grades. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, your grade 11 grades can be used for early admission purposes at UBC. But it is not the end of the world. And, and even with this, you know that scholarship that's determined on your GPA, it... it it adds it up on the courses required for graduation. So let's say you took physics 11 and you took a, a chem 11, just throwing it out there. And your physics mark was higher than your chem. Because you only need one science, 
they have a computer program that automatically chooses the mark that's in the student's best interest. Okay. So, you know, sometimes I'll never recover. Oh, yes, you will. Just, just uh, grade 11, especially is a year for looking at options. Okay. Uh, how do I decide uh, which courses to take? Uh, I often say your report card shows where you are in a class, right? You can't ignore those numbers, right? Anytime a student comes to see me and has chosen a course, first thing I look at is where their marks are. They should be an accurate reflection of the student's uh, ability at this stage, or at least effort at this stage. If they've worked hard, that, that's a good thing to pay attention to. Those marks shouldn't be just ignored. In our programming guide, you'll actually see recommended prerequisite scores. Now they're recommended. So you know, it says like 73, 75 for math 10, a pre-calc 10 to go into the higher level pre-calc 11. Uh, that, that, that's a guideline uh, because if you don't hit that, you might want to rethink your math course for grade 10. I'll talk about it and I'm sure Miss Cameron will talk about it as well. Again, talk to your teachers. You've got to be realistic. You've got to be realistic. With the grade 11s this, or grade 12s, going into grade 12, I said, tell me the courses you want to take and then tell me the reason why you want to take those courses. What is your plan? Because invariably, what I see in September and Mr. Spangers is, yeah, I took this course. Why did you take it? I don't know. Well, we got we got to get beyond that. They got to have a reason for taking the courses that they are. So we're pushing them in that direction. Uh, we won't spend much time here. These are the the prerequisites or the requirements for graduation in the province of British Columbia. Our students hit these. They automatically hit these. We make sure they hit these. There's a one thing that we'll talk about tonight that came to our attention where we're trying to close a little loophole, but our students do hit these. So uh, you don't even have to worry about them. We make sure they do. We run them through a program in grade 12 that makes sure they do. And now I think we're even doing it in grade 11 and grade 10 moving forward. They will hit those. So don't have to worry too much about that right now. Here's a biggie, you know. Uh, our students, half over half of our students go to SFU or UBC. But there are a ton of other options out there, right? They're great schools, SFU and UBC, but they happen to be two of the most difficult schools to get into in the country. And there are wonderful options in other places or colleges, and I think uh, it's mandatory that kids have options. Our students are encouraged to have multiple realistic options open. I won't mention the children, child's name today, but a grade 12 girl came in to see me. She's applying to her uh, a UBC, SFU, and I think U of A. I said, what school did you choose that's local where you can be sure that you'll get a seat at a college that's a good option? I didn't do that. You have to do that. Right now, at, at, at this time of year, uh, students are starting to hear about acceptances at places. And I'll tell you, you don't have to be a psychologist to see it. Kids will come in here and they'll say, I got accepted into CAP. My goal is SFU, but I got accepted into CAP. And you just see their shoulders relax. Mr. Bowman, I got accepted. They're happy about it. Then they go on and hope that they get into places like SFU or UBC. It's such, I mean, it costs about $60 to apply but it's $60 well spent. It just gives your son or daughter a backup plan and a legitimate backup plan. Our schools, our colleges are designed, not, not to, they are designed to transfer to university. That's the plan. Uh, they are smaller schools, cheaper schools, smaller class sizes, and oftentimes closer, right? So uh, I think, uh, that's, a, that's a real legitimate thing that all of you should think of. It's about finding the best fit. You know, sometimes I see a student who gets into SFU or is striving to get into SFU. I, honestly, you're more suited to college right now. Your, matur your maturity level academically isn't quite there yet. Go there. Enjoy the experience. Save yourself some money and figure it out that way. Now, you can go. I just got a bunch of these logos here. Because our kids, 
uh, do go to different universities, right? And some of them are listed here. Uh, we have kids at all of these schools, right? At all of those colleges, technical schools, Queens, uh, they're, they're all going here. Here is exactly, I'm sorry, this is a little blurry, uh, but uh, this is where our kids went last year, right? And if I wasn't tied to this podium, uh, if you look in the second column, you'll see SFU, 42. 42 of our grads went to SFU, 31 to UBC. So that's more than half of our kids go to those schools. But you look, they all found their best fits. BCIT, wonderful school. You kind of have to have an idea what you want to do. You don't go there and discover yourself, but it's a wonderful school. And seven of our kids are there. Cap you, one girl into theatrical makeup at Blanche McDonald. We got Emily Carr, art students, because I see Miss Codd came in, our art teacher, who will talk about that. A kid who was in the film, kind of cool. Kind of cool what they get into. Uh, you know what I like? You see this uh, Dal Housey, you know? Uh, that's a young lady, very bright, on a full ride in Dalhousie in Halifax, $26,000 scholarship, studying agricultural science. She emails me that she's all excited that she goes out every time uh, in the morning, she's assigned a cow to milk, you know? <laughs> Great fit for her. Like, the girl is just pumped about it. It's all about finding the right fit, right? Uh, these sites will all be live. All the links are live. This education planner is a great site to go on to because all you do is say, I'm looking at nursing. And it will tell you every school in the province that offers a nursing program. Now it's only, it's only, uh, uh, it's only uh, what do you call that school? It's only BC schools. <laughs> Canadian University event, just so you know, you're two years away. But the Canadian universities are in BC for almost six weeks recruiting. They want our kids. They want our kids. So they, this is a wonderful site that offers information on about 60 or 70 Canadian schools. Very good to look at. This is kind of like Education Planner. This is new to me. You type in the program, and you'll find the schools that offer that program. Good things to do. You have this course selection sheet in front of you, or at least you should, if Mr. Spangers did his job. We're gonna work a little ways through this. Tomorrow I present to our grade 11s going into grade 12. Today, we're presenting to the grade 10s going into 11. And I think the 11 is the year to experiment or to see, like if you say, oh, I might wanna do sciences, I'm not sure yet. Well, you try chem and physics. If your marks indicate that you're capable, if you're not hitting 75, 70s in the maths, Maybe not, but it's the year to experiment. And, and I know a lot of times parents put that pressure on their kids. Oh, you got to do the sciences. But they'll find out in grade 10 and grade 11 if they take those courses, whether or not they have the actual interest and skill to handle that, right? So it's kind of the year uh, to keep options open. And as I told the grade 11s going into 12, you got more data in front of you. You got a year of these courses. Now you got to think about, okay, maybe science won't be my first choice. Maybe I can go into the arts. I, you're going to hear it. Um, there are, everybody thinks science is where the jobs are. The jobs are in the arts. The jobs, all the various kinds of jobs that you get to, they come through the arts and not just science. So there's wonderful ways, right? I, and I see kids all the time. I say, you are into the arts. You've got a great person. All the soft skills that we don't value all the time, the kid has it through the yin-yang. Go there, go into those, that area rather than science because you think that's where the jobs are, right? Uh, let's see, what do we got? Things to consider. Every university has admission requirements for every faculty that they offer. When I started this job 15, 20 years ago with, the great, with SFU and UBC, I was able to produce a summary sheet for both of those schools. It can't be done anymore. There are so many variables. So literally, it involves some research. We have a good idea for SFU UBC. I'll show you sites here at the end, or at least show you the links. Uh, but every school has it. And you know, I tell the students, they're digital natives. I'm not. Go, simply go. University of Toronto admission requirements. 
and it will take you to their site. Uh, now, I warn you, every site's a little different, but those kids know how to click on buttons. They'll figure it out. And you can see which courses are required to be an art student, a science student, an optometrist, whatever it would be. I can't stress that enough. We encourage our kids to take at least five to six academically approved courses. And when we go through this list, I'll tell you what those are. Okay? Uh, so these are the, uh, that's the list you're looking at. Whoopsie. And uh, we'll work through this. So you see the map, uh, first of all, Kids will say, I have no idea where to start. Well, let's do the ones you know you got to do. You guys are choosing eight courses. So you're going to take religion, you have no choice. You're going to take career life connections, which isn't a block. It's just a course you take, so that doesn't count. But you are going to take English. I'll talk about the name change for English, because that's important. And then you're going to take a math, right? A math. And you have four options in, in, in uh, grade uh, 11, or yes, yeah, you do. Four options in grade 11. Uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, workplace uh, uh, math gets you your credit for graduation and you need one of those for graduation. You need one math, as it says on the left, you gotta take one at the grade 11 level. You won't graduate unless you have a math 11 course. And any one of those counts. Then you can get pre-calc 11. And pre-calc 11 is a good course because it keeps all the options open. You can be an engineer, you can be a, 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 a mathematician, it's everything. Or you can go uh, to pre-calc enriched, which we offer as well. And pre-calc enriched does not show as enriched on a, cal on a, on a, uh, a transcript, but what it does is it exposes kids to a higher level of math uh, and more challenging as they move through the program, right? So that's kind of cool. Now, as a rule, students who took Foundations 11 uh, should take this option if they want to go to post-secondary, right? Po uh, like if, if you're not very strong in math, it's a little confusing this thing. Uh, if you want to go to math, you got to take Foundations, uh, 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 a Foundations 11 or a pre-calc to graduate. Foundations 11 is, if you have like a 70 in pre-calc or the regular math 10, foundations might be the stream for you. It's not easy math. It's just different math. It's just different math, a different type of math. And Miss Cameron will talk about that even more. So if, and then of course, this is for the guys tomorrow night. Remember if you're in the foundation stream though, if you go this way, I would highly recommend that in grade 12, you take the Foundations 12 stream, okay? So you're gonna choose one of these maths as a grade 10 going into 11. Workplace is people who struggle with math and it's not even trades math because uh, BCIT wants you to have the highest level of math that you can accomplish, right, or get. So it's really very limited. We have very low numbers in that course. Foundations 11, I think we have one block of Foundations 11 from year to year, and it starts off fairly low. We start off at like 15, 16, and now uh, Mr. Borthistle teaches that class, and he has 25, 26 in the room. Uh, I wish, I hope, and, and maybe when you guys talk about it at home with your kids, if we can get them to decide Foundations earlier, then who knows, maybe we can offer two blocks Make it a little better. Who knows how it will all work out. But the foundation stream, I don't think is enough subscribed at our school. Uh, there should be more students going that way. If you went down the road and you went to Burn Creek or one of those other schools, the majority of the kids go to foundations. And, Bur and Peacock is the, is the other alternative, right? That the smaller numbers. We're the exact opposite. That's good for us. Kids are challenging themselves. We've got a bright crew, that's cool. Uh, but I think some of them are miscast thinking, I'm going to go to science, I'm going to do this, and ignoring those prerequisite numbers. Uh, hopefully that makes some sense to you. Uh, let's see. And then there's Foundations 12 down the road, right? So the other advantage of taking pre-calc 11 is that you take it in one year, you get your 75, you pull the Band-Aid off, and that's it. Uh, you don't have to take any more math as an art student. Foundations, you got to do two years. But I'll tell you, you can physically see the difference 
and kids who decide to take the foundation stream in grade 11 and 12 because they've been beating their head against the rock in pre-calc. They don't want to be an engineer. They don't want to be a scientist. They don't want to be an accountant. They're beating their head against the rock. Parents are paying big money for tutors and all that kind of stuff. And then they decide to take foundations. And again, you just see the relaxation. So challenge is important. Absolutely, I would encourage any kid to challenge themselves. Being realistic, looking long term, that's what we hope we do a little more thinking about that this year. Right? Uh, let's see, what do we have next? Uh, yeah, so this is just looking down the stream. You can do pre-calc 12. Uh, and I don't know if you guys want to hear about this. You can plan it down the road. Uh, but in grade 12, the biggest question I have to ask is, uh, have asked is calculus. Calculus, calculus. People don't, are they, the death, it's a tough course. But it is absolutely a gateway course, right? You had the pre-calc 11 and to get in. You get to grade 12, you take pre-calc 12 and calculus. And kids are, they, it, it is a tough course. But it's so advantageous to see it in high school. So I'll just throw out a little ad for that. It's advantageous. As a science kid, absolutely, I would say it's not required everywhere, but it should be because you get it when you're in university. And uh, as a business kid, it's one of those, you, you see it in your first year of business and then you never see it again. But as it shows here, there's 50% failure rates in that first year course, 50%. And we're not talking about regular kids. Reg These are kids who are bright enough to get into university and 50% of them are failing it. Don't want to spend a lot. That's more a grade 12 issue. Oh, I almost missed her. Uh, 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 this computer science, we only created about two years ago. Mr. Zelenko isn't here. Uh, computer science is an awesome course. Uh, but it is very difficult and challenging. And we're going to explain a little later how you can get into that course. Uh, but people who like computers, computer science is another way to get a math credit. It's not a replacement for pre-calc or whatever, but it's, a, it's a, a good way to get a math credit. Science is the other question. And the most obvious, uh, most common combination of sciences that our students take are chemistry and physics, right? Because you need it to get into most science programs right across the country. We have 108 kids in Physics 11. Uh, I, I, that's a tribute to Mr. Muse, I think. They like hanging out with them. Uh, but that's a lot of kids. But even in chem, we have 80 some odd kids. And I can honestly say some of those kids shouldn't be in there, right? It's, uh, it's, it's so tough. And, and, and you know, you, you hit the wall and you, I, I just dropped a kid from chem today. Right? They just say, oh, I want to focus on my other courses, all that kind of stuff. If we can nail that in the bud earlier, uh, that's not a bad thing. Now, I got here, students wanting to keep uh, legitimate options open will take those. Students in low Bs in the sciences and prerequisite do not typically raise their science grades in the upper level. You understand that, right? Because lots of them will say, oh, yeah, I got a 65, but I'm, I'm really going to work. That hardly ever works. I'd say, and you see a nod from the Miss Cameron, right? It just like it gets harder. It just gets harder, and and then they they end up being in a headspace and in a course that doesn't really fit uh, fit for them. Uh, science gets so much tougher. So now you got two types of kids: kids who get a lousy mark and say, "I'm going to beat this. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to study," and then other ones who will turtle. And I would say, unless you have that work ethic and a passion for the sciences, and a reason to take that course, uh, it's tough, tough to improve, right? You need a strong work eth ethic and be able to handle adversity, right? Uh, we have, look at this. Now, just to look down the road, parents who are thinking science or nothing, right? Uh, the average mark to get into sciences and, and, and math at SFU is around 86%. 86% in the science courses. So you got to know your center. Are they capable of that kind of mark? It might drop a little bit to 82, 83, maybe. But I don't want to set them up and say, hey, I, I hit 83 and I didn't get in. Right? Uh, it's around 86 normally. That's tough. That's a high marks. Right? And look at good old UBC science. 92. 
And I've seen students not get in that 92, right? It's really super tough. And, and there's a profile involved and all that stuff. It's super tough. Now, our students do get in. We got kids that get in. Our kids do well there. But it's the ones where it's the right fit, right? It's just the right fit. I think just, you know, for myself, it's a good idea to, to kind of have a, 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 a sum exposure to all the, all the sciences between grade 11 and 12. You do not have to take three science 12s. But if you can somehow do a life science and great, and I don't say this to be mean or to, you know, to be irrational. If you're a science person, I was looking at the UBC site. I have a lovely girl in my religion class. And she goes, oh, you only need one science to get into UBC, math and English. That's it. I says, let's look a little deeper. Because they, they look for more. They look for calculus not a requirement to look for it. They look for another science. And then I said, you know what you should also do when you go on to these sites? Not just look at the admission requirements, look at the degree requirements. And when you see the degree requirements, you see they get some exposure to three sciences. So it's kind of handy if you see some of it in, in high school, right? Not mandatory, but you know, just kind of thinking about it, right? Now, I got here, it's totally different if you want to be a nurse. And some programs ask for Chem 11, right? And they don't want a 98 in Chem. If you pull off your 70, 75 in Chem, uh, then, then you're great for nursing. You're good to go, right? Uh, but a lot of our kids go, oh, God, I failed. I got only a 70, 75. I'm doomed. I'm absolutely doomed. No. You, you, it's what your goal is. You want to do Chem, right? And you want to do nursing. So it's kind of important. Facing adversity, how do you handle it? That kind of thing. And when I was talking about options other than UBC and SFU science, the colleges offer transfer programs. You can go in there, you get smaller classes. Good old Mr. Toth will say, I like the Langara one, because you get more lab time. You get more lab time there. And he go, you know, it's not a bad option for some of our kids to go to. Instead of going to classes where you can have three or 400 people in the room, you might be in a class with 60, 70. You might have a teacher that's accessible. You know, all these different things, right? So you got to keep, don't eliminate, you know, because all their, uh, just, you might have to choose a different route to get into sciences. Hope that makes some sense. But science isn't the be all and the end all. Now we have uh, anatomy is bio, right? So a lot of our kids take life, or can take life science, chem, physics. You need one science 11 to graduate. And you'll see the lonely soldier down there, specialized science 12. And you'll see it's in the grade 11 column. Because technically, for, G, for university purposes, it's a grade 11 class. They, they don't look at it as a GPA booster. Because it, it, it's, not, it's a different type of science, right? It's just a different type of science. It's meant for kids who need a science credit, and they can't necessarily handle the science 11s that are listed above, the core ones. And we have a great teacher, I think, teaching that course, uh, Ms. McCall, who is teaching the course and making it practical and making it fun for the kids. So these are kids who struggle with science, and they're getting something out of it, right? They do research on nutrition or whatever. They do a presentation to the class. That's great skills, great skills, right? Uh, you do not have to take all three science 12s, only if you're really, really strong uh, science student, right? Would you even think of doing that? Uh, I do think between, like I said, between 11 and 12, you see, get exposed to each one. Uh, I think if you could pull that off, which you can do. Uh, uh, you have to graduate, specialized science. I talked about that. Next. Uh, socials. We have all the socials courses there. Uh, these are all uh, courses that are, you notice they're all 12s. Uh, the government mandates that you uh, take a socials 11 or 12 to graduate. We only offer 12. That's great for your kids because these courses are all academically approved as well. So they get their grade 11 credit, but they also get a credit that universities look at. That's a cool thing. Uh, we do have some kids who will take this economic, economic theory 
and uh, genocide and social justice as courses. Look what it says here. These courses are worth eight credits each. So that's a good course if you want to get into the arts at university. In grade 11, awesome, right? If, you, if you're an art student, you want to go to UBC and you take those, uh, those courses, social justice, genocide, economic, economic theory, you got four courses that you can use to, uh, to, to be considered for admissions at university. So if you're an art student and thinking that way, that's kind of a good, good thing, okay? Uh, let's see, anything we need to know. I will tell you, so they're pretty simple. Uh, world history, uh, just uh, I've told the kids, it's a tough course, right? Uh, but it is a wonderful course for preparing for the writing expected at university. So we don't want people walking in there thinking, oh, it's, good. it's got substance to it, right? Law too. Physical geography, uh, if I was teaching, we won't get too much, physical geography, is if you're an art student at university, they like you to have some science background too. And I use, I was, I went for arts, and I use geography as my science option, right? You could do geology, you could do all this stuff. It's kind of cool. And uh, a lot of our students will go for that option. You need a socials 11 or 12 to graduate, our kids get tongue, right? Eight credits, uh, yeah, I covered that off. What next? Uh, these are, our art education and ADST courses. And that's why we have this table of teachers here. Uh, they will talk or answer any of your questions about any uh, specifics in this course. I'm gonna give you a real cursory view over. You need one of these courses to graduate uh, in 10, 11, or 12. So if you've done band 10, you've met this requirement, right? You've met it. So I, our kids don't have a lot of trouble getting the ADSD credit, this, this uh, uh, arts education in ADSD. Uh, all the out outlines are on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the course programming guide, and these young people will fill in things. The cool part, right, the cool part, and I stressed it with my grade 11s today because I talked to them. Uh, you know, in the old days, if you took art or you took drama, you know, uh, those courses were like, oh, you took art and drama. Now, schools are looking at art and drama marks and counting it in the art student's entry GPA because they figure it's the whole person. We should look at that. If they're good at art, they're good at drama, uh, why not have them in that class? So, and I like it too because you're using a different part of your brain. You're not all the time, you know, focusing on pure academics. You get into the arts, you get into drama, and I walk by these classes and I go, there's some cool things going on here. And it can potentially benefit you university-wise. Excellent. Uh, you must complete one. And last year we had a new course created, offered uh, by Mr. Bao called Tech Technology Explorations 10. And what that does is kind of a, a class that prepares students to go into grade 11 and 12 courses uh, in, in the uh, STEM-related activities. And some of your sons or daughters have probably already done that, taken the tech explorations. It's interesting as heck and very, very uh, worthwhile. <coughs> if you haven't done that, then you're gonna have to go visit Mr. Bao and talk and talk about your background. And we might still be able to get you into programs, uh, even though you missed that course. So don't think that's all, it's all done. And he's the man. You know, uh, uh, to talk to about that. I will say that our engineering and, and courses like that involve a little more design and planning. It's not that you're going in, uh, this, like this would replace woodwork or, or uh, guitar building. You know, so it's not like you're sanding a block for 30 minutes. Uh, you're designing the sander to sand that block in a more efficient manner that doesn't hurt your ankle or wrist. You know, if you sand with your ankle, with your ankle, but then you're maybe not right for that course. Just throwing it out there. It's a, it's a, it's a good course. And most ADSD courses uh, uh, can, uh, are, uh, could not currently be used because it's an applied skill. But I noticed, finally, the schools are waking up that a course like engineering, which is an absolutely wonderful course to take, is now what they call a LISP-B course at SFU. That's good because I'll tell you, if you want to be an engineer, you'll have a good job, what the job, good idea what the job entails by going through uh, uh, that class.
but I'll get him to talk about it more. Uh, media arts, Mr. Brown is the media arts teacher. He's not here, but his camera is. Let's give it up for the camera. Yeah, so he is here at the camera form. It's a cool course, right? You learn how to film events, take pictures, do professional things, Photoshop, all this kind of stuff. It's really cool. And when he, we're, we're going to present this to the kids, by the way, too, at Salomon. Uh, but the only thing that he said is uh, stress is that sometimes there's an expectation that you attend events after school to film events or take pictures. Like, I don't know if you guys look at our Google page, but we broadcast games and all this kind of stuff. That's all our media arts kids doing it. Great skill. And in Vancouver, where those kind of skills are kind of valued, that's, that's kind of cool, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a good course. And uh, computer tech, Mr. Zelenko isn't here. Uh, we have, if you've done tech explorations, you can move into computer programming and computer programming 12. If you're talking to your kids, great course, great course, and uh, more accessible. And then we also offer that computer science 12. Now, that's, a, that's, a, a, that's the equivalent of calculus or pre-calc 12. It's not for the weak of heart. Uh, but if you're going to go that route, talk to Mr. Zelenko. It's a great course to have. One of the things I hear from our alumni coming back is I, I wish I had some programming. I wish I had some programming skills. They wish they had seen that. Now, they can usually pick it up. But if they see that kind of stuff here, I think that's to their advantage. Uh, let's see. What do we have next? Uh, yeah, we don't have to go over that one. Ah, uh, this might be. And here, Mr. Uh, Shoemaker uh, will uh, 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 add some details. As a parent, you know, uh, should we encourage our kids to take summer or online courses? I'll tell you, for the last while, we as an academic counseling department have not encouraged kids to take online courses. That doesn't come out of thin air. There's some logic be behind it. I don't know if you guys can remember back when you were young, but I certainly can. Summers were times for me to relax and unwind. Uh, summers were time for me to develop other skills as, an as a worker, uh, uh, as a leadership position in a camp. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Jared Power, Mr. Power, you know him? I was doing a presentation, and uh, I got to give him credit when he says something that's intellectual. I don't know how often it happens, but it did this time. And you know what he says? He has a brother that's about three or four years older than him, and uh, he, he, has a, he employs 50, 60 people. And he says, they come in with their GPA, and their GPA is stellar but they can't work. They don't know how to work. They don't know how to problem solve, think on their feet, work with discipline, the skills. And I got to say, when he said it, I said, gosh, I hear that all the time. The kids get it. And unless they're told specifically what to do, they don't, they don't think on their feet and learn those, those employable skills, which are, I think, really super valuable, right? Those are really super valuable. Uh, honestly, what you can learn in six weeks, you cannot learn it's not the same as what you can learn in a year. And I think getting ahead is not necessary. I gotta say, we have a lot of kids who are scrambling to find a course to fill their schedule because they loaded up when they were young, right? And I don't think it serves a heck of a lot of advantage. I'll tell you this, because usually money talks. We have two kids the last, last year and the year before, one young lady won $80,000. She did not take, as a scholarship, one online course. Last year, a boy won $160,000. I think that's twice as much. Yeah, All right. he won $160,000. And he took no online courses. They joined clubs, they did things and developed other skills. I think that's super important. Now, uh, if you're going to, uh, uh, your son or daughter does want to take an online course, online course Mr. Spangers and I in our office have a form. This form, the student will have to go to the subject teacher that they're in now. And they're going to say, does this make sense? Should I, could I be able to do this? We're going to take it to you guys so that you sign off on it. We're going to talk probably to the admin to make sure that happens. There's going to be a process. 
And I think Mr. Shoveler, or that's not your name, Mr. Shoemaker is champing at the bit because this is important, right? Uh, you can't take the form unless we take the course unless you know it, right? And you have to bring in proof of completion of the course, a final mark in that course, before we'll make any change to your schedule. And the reason we're doing that is because, did you want to say it, Mr. Shu, or? Oh, hey, okay, I won't steal your thunder. I won't steal your thunder. Yeah, uh, but things can slip through the cracks, right? Online courses are kind of hit or miss, right? Uh, here's another, uh, I think, study blah, oh, course, oh yeah, here's the second slide on this. Courses required for graduation, like English 10, like uh, English 12, they have to be completed by us at our school. You, you are an STM student. We need to know that you are meeting our rigor. Uh, we need to see that. Courses that are re, uh, have a prerequisite or as a prerequisite for higher level courses, let's say you take a course like Chem 11 online with the idea of taking Chem 12 here, despite our repeated warnings, you're gonna get your world rocked. You just don't get the background in that six week period that you do over a year at the school, right? Uh, grades for online courses have always, we've never counted them in your STM GPA, right? Uh, we don't have any accountability for where that mark came from. When it's done here, we can. So you get a mark, uh, but it doesn't count to your STM GPA. Again, like you said, taking a break from academics can reduce stress. You get enough credits without it. And I'll tell you, there, the word is out about online it's been out for a long while, and summer courses about the lack of preparation and perhaps inflated grades coming around. UBC will ask students, did you take a summer course? It's not the end of the world, but they wanna make sure because honestly, there are kids who take summer courses, score really high online, and that does not translate into success at university. So they wanna know about it. So if you say, I did it, because I had to fit it into my schedule or I was way for hockey. Well, that's a reason. But if you did it, which some people do, uh, to kind of manipulate the system to a higher mark, they're going to catch that. They will catch that, right? They're concerned about mark inflation. When I go to counselor days, when they're back on again and COVID is over, uh, what, the, what I hear is not admission so much, retention. Retention. What are retention rates? How many kids get into university and succeed and manage to stay there because they're losing kids? And our percentage of success at university is high, but there are other schools where it's 30, 40% of kids who get in end up in some kind of academic difficulty after a year. So they're trying to close that down. And I think online might be part of it. Uh, resume padding is an issue for another day, uh, I think. Uh, study blocks are available to grade 12s only, okay? TA blocks is something that we limit to grade 12s only. Uh, there is a possibility that you could teach, be a teaching assistant for somebody, a teacher, and help them. Uh, that's kind of a cool way uh, to fill your schedule. I just wanted to say, almost done. The more accurate the course selection is at this time, this is what we're really trying to produce or uh, encourage, the easier it will be for admin to set up a schedule that best fits predicted needs. We want to try to avoid a lot of changes. So you know how you have that foundation's 11. You know, if you got 15, you offer one block. But if we see at the outset, we're at 24, we go, oh, maybe we have to think about two or at least be prepared for that. So think about that. Give us your best guess. Uh, our goal is to give the students their actual schedule in early June. If you were around last year, you got it in August. June gives us a time to look at what a kid's chosen, figure out their schedule, gives Mr. Spanges and I a chance to uh, uh, change schedules if we have to, and perhaps even enjoy our summer. Uh, trust us, I think that's a big thing. Uh, these aren't live yet, but they will be. Uh, this uh, SFU site's wonderful. You're a student from BC, you wanna get into arts, these are the courses you need. The second one, right, you can play around with this. Uh, you put what year, you, you, you're going to go into, say, fall uh, at SFU. 
and you put down every school, you, every course in grade 11 or 12 that you plan to take or have taken, as wonderful, it will spit out every faculty you qualify for. I wish every school had that, instead of all these reams of paper. They've done a brilliant job of this. It's really accurate. And you know this one here, I asked if you actually, yeah, has a good site where they go, what would I do with a degree in? Because some kids don't know. What would I do with a degree in anthropology, communications, or whatever? And they take you through the uh, 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 your career offerings, uh, job skills you should have, courses you should take, and I, I think it's a great site. Now, every school has it. Uh, I like SFUs. I find it user-friendly. And uh, then there's this one, and I, it's not live yet. UBC requirements, and I've not mentioned it yet. UBC and U of T and a few schools, look at your GPA when you apply, but also ask you to complete a personal profile. Tell me what you have done to prepare yourself for your transition to UBC. Now, your GPA can be covered in numbers, eh? 93.6, but what you did during the summers, the leadership you did, the soft skills, uh, the, the teams you played for, that is the meat that they're looking for. So they can differentiate you from, from other students. It's what scholarships look for, right? All that whole, developing the whole person. So I know there's all this trend and all this pressure, put kids in classes, more classes, but let them be kids. Let them deal with stress. We hear about stress enough, right? Well, let's try to work on that. You know, give them a break during the summer. And then also uh, uh, develop other skills. Okay. I believe that is it for moi. Yes. Can I who the huh? Disconnect from that. Oh, my God. And I'm going to take this. Too. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I barely know you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Paul. Oh, Foreman. sorry. <laughs> Disconnect. There you go, bud. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowman. I'm not going to take too much of your time because I want to give more time to Mr. Bao and the, the elective teachers here. Um, but I'm just going to quickly talk about our new policies that were sent out. And Mr. Bowman alluded to these a little bit, particularly our, our external course policy. Um, the biggest reason for us trying to to put some kind of uh, guidelines out there about external courses is to make sure that students are on track to graduate. That's the number one reason. The other reason is to make sure that students develop the skills and understanding to have success in their courses. So this year alone, we've found at least six students who are in danger of not graduating because they took online courses and they have missed requirements or they haven't completed them. So those are things that we've found and discovered and have to, we've had to go back, help them, figure it out. I talked to four students just today who, because they tried to accelerate two years ago, they're actually caught in a curriculum change right now because all students in grade 11 currently who are graduating in the year that they'll graduate, they, need a, 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 they have a requirement to have an indigenous course credit. These four students missed that because they accelerated it. Because right now we're offering that in our English program. That's how most, students, most schools are doing that. These four students don't have that. So now these four students, because they chose to try and accelerate, they have to take another course. They have to do this on their own time. So this is one of the big reasons why we are, are putting these guidelines around the external course policies. These are on our website. I'm not gonna take the, the time to go through this. This was sent out to families, but please understand these are coming from a, a place of trying to make sure that students are prepared the best they possibly can be. We've also had situations where, as Mr. Bowman alluded to, students take a prerequisite class in the summer, expecting to like, hey, I can get ahead, or I don't have to take this one class with this particular teacher and then they come back the next year intending to take the grade 12 component of that class, and they can't. They really can't have the success because they haven't developed the understanding that you get from taking a full year course 
at the school. So these are the big reasons why we're, why we're doing this, right? Now, if there's a course not offered by the school, yeah, maybe we can look at that. Come talk to us. As Mr. Bowman said, there's a course, there's a, a, a form to fill out and a process involved with that. Okay, I'm going to skip through these fairly quickly here because you don't need this. The other policy that we're bringing in is a course change policy. And again, this is designed from a point of view of trying to make sure that we're supporting students, but also supporting our teachers too. Over the last number of years, we've noticed more and more and more students wanting to drop classes in December, in January, in February, and, and that's not helpful for them. It's not helpful for those classes that they're trying to move into because now you have a class that's been balanced and all of a sudden now it's not balanced. We have a teacher who's been teaching 28 students and moving ahead with the curriculum and they have one student parachuting in midway through the year or wanting to do that and they're going, this student just entered my classroom two weeks before report cards are due. What do I do with this student? And to be honest with you, they don't even have the credit hours to be able to, they don't have the, the, the enough time in that class to be able to get that credit. So the biggest change with this is that come next year, and we're starting to implement it now, after the, the Thanksgiving day long weekend, there won't be any changes to classes anymore. Now, obviously, some things come up case by case basis. Yes, we have fielded many of those requests so far. Very few of them have, have been successful in changing courses because usually when we have a chance to sit down with a student, they're wanting to change for reasons that aren't actually beneficial to them. So please understand that. We take each instance case by case, but as a broad policy, after Thanksgiving, we will not be allowing students to change their courses. So that means over the next few weeks, we're asking students and families to really seriously think about your course selections, right? First of all, does it meet their academic goals? Does it serve their strengths? And does it serve their interests too? Those are really, those are really three key things that we ask you to think about. And that's all that I'm gonna talk about. I'll be here to talk about these policies afterwards if anybody has any questions. I'm just gonna skip through these slides really quickly. There we go, Mr. Powell. We'll just change and click that on here. Anywhere? Oh, well, we're, yeah, it'll pick you up. Do I have to stand here? Oh, uh, right. <laughs> I think I might just turn it off to say no. <laughs> Evening. It's all good. Right, I'm going to hold it because I can't get it on. So, um, right. I'll primarily talk about the ones in the top right here because um, colleagues are here to talk about art and drama and they'll do a far better job talking about art and drama provisions than I will, far better. I will say with the, in relation to the engineering courses, I think it's important to say it is different to what you might see as woodwork. Where I'm from, woodwork disappeared in 1988, um, which is a long time ago. Uh, it's very much, it's not stand and sand and it's not banging bits of wood together and there you go. You do do a lot of thinking and there's a lot of problem solving and there's a lot of design thinking and lots and lots of preparation for engineering as you go into university. Mr. Bowman did a wonderful job in outlining what the course does and the topics and the academic requirements, we can talk individually, you can come and ask me questions, but I I think it does need to be clear with everyone. It's not like it's not woodwork. Um, if you've got a question about robotics and computer programming and computer science, please feel free to come and ask me as well. Um, Mr. Zalonka and I do talk regularly, so I do know a little bit or just enough about what goes off in those programs. So if you've got a question this evening, please come and ask, and I'll do my best to answer them. If I can't, I do advise your son or daughter to go and ask him directly as soon as possible, um, just so he can answer your question and they can feed that back to you. One thing with those courses, 
And you'll see the one at the top that says Tech Explorations, which was new this year. It is important that the student had had experience with that this term or and next term. Right? If they haven't, they might find grade 11 and 12 difficult. Again, it's on a student-to-student -student basis. If they had myself in grade 9, um, they need to come and talk to me about what grade 11 or 12 is about, really because they could expect one thing and it's very different. I had two come today who I spoke to, I had them in grade nine, very good students and we had a good chat and the expectations were clear, but it's, it's important that there is a conversation before you choose, oh, I'm gonna do engineering at 11 and you didn't do Tech X 10. Right, Tech X, the top one was very much designed to give students preparation for all of the ones below it the design engineering, robotics, computer programming and computer science. Um, they need to have a conversation with either myself or Mr. Zolonko before going into the grade 11. And I think that's it. I think anything else in terms of topics, I don't want to keep you too long. Come and ask after we've talked and I'll be honest with you, basically. Next. Who wants to next? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I want to talk about uh, my field of expertise, which is drama, drama 11 particularly, because I think your sons and daughters are in uh, grade 10 this year. The first thing is that the fine arts are an amazing way to build core competencies in all the areas thinking skills, creative thinking skills, critical thinking skills. We don't think of that as a fine arts strength, but it absolutely is. Reflective thinking, collaboration, communication, huge, of course, which you take into every subject area and also into the workplace. Personal and identity issues, building our sense of identity building our sense of personal responsibility in our community and our social responsibility. We work on all of those skills and they're all useful and transferable to physics and chemistry and uh, English. Drama and art and all of the fine arts help you in those other subject areas and people uh, often don't think about that. If we're looking at critical thinking skills, analyzing movement on stage, how objects, actors move in space, how do we best create movement? How do we fix problems? How do we get feedback from our teacher and improve uh, a scene or our, the short play that we're doing? You need amazing critical thinking skills for all of those and, and analytical skills. Great actors and directors are good in all of those areas. And those areas can help you across the board in all of your subject areas. Drama 11 and 12 are geared toward actors and non-actors. Because as I said, you get, you get um, skill building and, and in all the competencies. In Drama 11, we start working on more advanced acting skills and techniques. How do you create a character? How do you know what to do with your lines? How do you analyze a script? How do you get emotional truth into your work? We work on all of those things at a higher level than we did uh, with Drama 10. Also in Drama 11, we're going to give the students more performance opportunities. So we are doing a production this year and we continue to do that every year and they can uh, go into the production. But also as a class, we will be performing for elementary school students about issues that concern the elementary school students. We will be working in festivals next year at the Drama 11 level 
uh, going to the theater twice a year, analyzing what we saw, the design, the acting, all of those wonderful components. So lots of performance opportunities next year, uh, as well as, as working in, in all of the other areas and the advanced acting techniques. Along with that, you get to improvise. How do you learn to think on your feet? It's so important to, to trust yourself, to have self-confidence, to know that you, you will come up with a solution. All of these things are worked on in our fine arts courses. Uh, so we play games, improvisations, and all of these things, although they're, they may seem like just fun, they're really, really, we're really sneaky about getting uh, skill building into those games. So they're very beneficial for students and they also enjoy them. Most of all, I want to say that when you take the fine arts drama, you build skills in ways that you can't do in other courses. You're um, accessing, as Mr. Um, uh, Bowman said, you're accessing the skills from different parts of your brain. Not everybody works well from a classroom seat. So here you get to move, you get to think and build these skills in, in ways that you don't in other courses. So thank you for that. Uh, I'll be here after we talk and, and if you have any questions, please ask me. Thanks. How do I do this? Just hang on to it, unless you, unless you want to clip it. Oh, no, that's okay. Good evening, welcome. Um, I'm the art teacher, Ms. Claude, Ms. Ursula Claude. Uh, I'm just gonna take you through a few um, of the electives that I teach at school. Um, so the first is design studies, or kids know it as architectural design. Um, but in curriculum, it's called drafting, and no one knows what drafting is. So um, I call it design studies because um, kids have the opportunity of exploring areas of design, um, not just architecture, but industrial design, landscape design, not fashion design, um, but we stick more to the built environments. Um, we probably cover a little bit of the industrial design, um, but more so architectural design, urban design, um, urban planning. Uh, so I'm going to give you some eye candy here because I think we need it, right? <laughs> uh, what's the difference between the three levels? So I've got drafting 10, 11, and 12. Um, the 10 level, so they're learning about the design process. Um, they're getting into 3D modeling skills using Google SketchUp, uh, learning some AutoCAD. Um, they learn about scale, ergonomics. Um, simple design problems. Um, we focus more on interior and architectural design. Um, drafting 11, uh, we're getting into um, some intermediate, uh, intermediate 3D modeling with Google SketchUp. Um, building systems, uh, more complex problems and design considerations. Um, we look at commercial, landscape, architectural design, urban planning and environmental design. Um, they, uh, they're now progressing, they're building on their AutoCAD skills and they have increased confidence with their presentation. So a lot of it, um, they, they go through the design process, um, they go through crit critique, they present, um, oftentimes not just to me, but um, other teachers or administrators in the school, or we've got people coming in as well that they, they present to. Um, we always try to do um, at least one project that is a real world project. Um, this, this year I've got students redesigning my art room, which is very exciting. Um, and hopefully I'm, be, I'm being told that uh, the money is going to be thrown at the art room next year. So um, it's um, an opportunity for them to actually create uh, models and walk through animations and really um, figure out, you know, what, you know, talk to the client, which in this case is me this year, um, and find out, okay, what does the client need and, and be creative and problem solving. Uh, drafting 12, 
Um, there, I, and I don't think that's on there um, as an option, but I do have a few students who did take um, drafting 11, so hopefully the, they do have the option of that. Um, they are moving into learning about Revit and more advanced building systems. Um, can you go back? Does it go back? Oh, okay. Um, they also have the opportunity, so in the 10 level, we look at international um, architects and designers, and they're, they're learning about the world of design so that they're not just replicating, you know, the house they live, live in or the, you know, building that they saw down the street, but they're being exposed to really exciting designs. Um, drafting 11, we're getting into local designers and architects, um, so they're uh, exploring design within their community and actually making connections there, which is awesome. Um, in Drafting 12, we get into more working drawings. So they are building their skill set and actually um, creating a full set of working drawings, which is exciting. And I have a lot of students in the past who've actually gone on. They've um, not just worked for builders or um, um, architects, but also um, factories, um, anywhere that needs AutoCAD, um, they can beef up their, um, their portfolio and their resume, uh, which is fabulous. And I have a lot of students who've gone on and done summer, summer jobs uh, working at these companies. And sometimes it starts as a volunteer base, but usually the companies hire them on. Um, a lot of the students that I that I have usually have a, a keen interest. So, I the the students that I get in these classes or in the, these classes here are fairly serious about or they have a keen interest. So, I find that their work ethic is really great. They're not they don't come into the course thinking this is you know an easy credit, uh, a few credits. So they actually have an interest and. Um, it feels like a, a studio, a working studio, um, and um, we have a lot of fun with it. So, anyways, we can move on. There's just some. Um, why take this course to be creative, solve problems, uh, learn to think and be designers, um, create cool things like buildings, furniture, interiors, landscape, products, uh, build your inventions to, um, or bring your inventions to life through drawings, uh, models, animations. This is a, if you want to just press play there, you can see this is a, a model created, a, a house design, and a, a walkthrough animation use, using SketchUp. Um, there's a little bit of a lag there, but uh, you get an idea as to um, what they're creating. Um, which is which is great, and I've got a lot of parents in the past as well who have brought projects to me, like, oh, I want to redo my basement or my bathroom, you know, can you work it in? And it, it and it's great because it actually um, it makes the course more real for for students, and I mean, it's it's good dinner conversation too, <laughs> um, and they're creating. They're creating models that can actually be used, um, you know, when you are talking to a, a designer or an architect. This is what I'm thinking about. Um, the, I mean, uh, I have, I've had students even work for um, uh, no, Home Depot. Yeah, Home Depot. Yeah, the kitchen designers, um, and be able because this is essentially, you know, they are they're creating models like this that um, help uh, clients envision spaces. Um, other things, so yes, they're using Google SketchUp, AutoCAD, Revit in the advanced level. Um, so these are tools that um, architects use day-to-day, uh, -day, designers use, builders use. Um, I think I've gone over most of it. Yeah, okay, you can switch. You can probably switch. Uh, some related careers, so yeah, why take this course? Maybe um, your son or daughter is interested in being an architect, an interior designer, uh, industrial or product designer, landscape architect, 
urban planner. I've had students who are like, I really want to design cars. <laughs> um, this is great too, right? Um, architectural technologist, game designer, animator. And I've, I get um, professionals to come in and talk about those uh, schools to come in and talk about programs as well. Um, I, I often get questions, you know, what's the difference between a technologist and an architect and interior designer? And that's almost what I start off doing day one is this. These are all the different uh, careers that you can kind of get into. And um, students get pretty excited about it. And, you know, they might have a rough idea in grade 10 or 11, but they're not quite sure. Um, this kind of solidifies whether or not this is a, a good field for them to go into. Um, it gives, on, gives them that hand-on experience. Anyways, we don't have to play through the whole, the whole thing there. Um, okay. <laughs> I know, I'm supposed to only have five minutes here, so <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, visual arts. So I teach visual arts 8 to 12. Um, the grade 8 and 9 level, I guess I don't need to talk about that, but the grade 8 and 9 level is uh, only a third of the year, which you probably already know. Um, uh, the... The 10, 11, 12 is a senior studio, so they get art a uh, full year. Um, what do they do in art? They explore a variety of materials, techniques, ideas, and learn to problem solve and express themselves visually. Um, they develop skills in drawing, painting, printmaking, multimedia, and sculpture, but they also um, move into um, digital uh, graphic arts, um, a lot of other areas that maybe you're, you don't connect to a traditional art room. Um, animation as well, sculpting. Um, they explore ideas, social, political, environmental, uh, personal, they problem solve in visual manner, um, experiment with veg uh, various techniques and develop their own unique style, uh, collaborate with others and the community. They use the design process, uh, so similar to design, um, from ideation all the way to a final product or final artwork. Um, they participate in critiques, which um, helps them in terms of presenting in front of others, gain confidence, be able to talk and think critically. Um, they build a portfolio. So I have all my students build a portfolio um, right from the get-go, right in grade 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. They all build a portfolio. And they might use it. They might not use it. I say hold on to it because you never know. Um, just like Mr. Bowman said, a lot of students start off. They might go down um, the science route and then they say, you know what, I'm really an arts kid and I've got to be true to myself. And, and then they're stuck. They're like, ah, oh, I have no portfolio. I need to apply for school. And they need a portfolio and they're scrounging. Um, so this, this is kind of the dirty work uh, that's done for them. Uh, what's the difference between the levels? Uh, I think I already talked about, yeah, grade eight and nine. Um, some sample projects. So we go through, uh, oh, actually, yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. Um, yeah, so anything from graphic design, you know, making posters, um, getting into really crazy in-depth drawings, um, paintings, uh, playing around with digital software and um, creating cards, animations, special effects, that kind of thing. Uh, really, uh, the, the senior studio is a lot of fun because the sky is the limit. We have access to the computer lab. We have access to all the traditional media. And it's really geared towards the student's interests. Um, oh, yeah, you can go back. Um, go back? Is it? No? Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. I'm mixing up the order here. Uh, why take this course? Um, a lot of students take it as a reprieve from other courses, from academics, right? They just need to use the other side of their brain um, to just release, to um, release stress. Um, and it's, it's great for that. Maybe it's not something that you want to pursue um, in post-secondary, and that's okay. Maybe it's something that you need to balance your life. 
right? And that's, that's all right too. I have a lot of students who come to me and they're like, I dress stick men. I can't do art, right? That's not, art is not for me. Um, art is for everyone. That's my belief anyways. Um, I, everyone is coming in with a certain skill set. It might be, uh, you may have not touched art in, since you were like six years old or eight years old, or maybe you do art every day. Um, it doesn't mean that everyone can't succeed. Um, so I try to be as um, objection, objectionable as possible with my marking. Um, I, I always tell students I mark the three C's. Concept, which is your idea. There's always an idea behind a project. Composition, so that's the layout and detail that you bring into it. It has nothing to do with, you know, are things proportional or anything like that. Um, and craftsmanship, so everyone can be neat and careful with tools. Right? Everyone can do those things and everyone is on their own path and developing their own skills at their own level. Um, so that's why I say art is for everyone. If it's something that interests you, um, you know, come in and try it out. Maybe you'll surprise yourself. Um, you learn ways to communicate your ideas visually and abstractly. It goes, goes into all kinds of fields, just like Mr. Bowman was saying, arts is everywhere. Everywhere you look, art and design is everywhere. You're sitting on art right now. Um, you look around the school, there's art. Um, this building, right? <laughs> everything was designed by someone. Um, and so being able to think in a visual manner and solve problems and talk about things in a visual way is, uh, is very useful. Um, Students play, explore, and experiment. I think that's, that's probably the biggest thing, the way that I teach, is I really want students to be playful and experiment, and that's what I push, right? It's not about being perfect, it's about letting go and trying things, right? And, and that's encouraged, I know, in science class as well. Right? It's encouraged in, um, in art. Uh, yes, I think, yeah, okay, yes, related careers. Oh, okay. Oh, I really want to show a little clip. Can I show yeah, we'll a clip? Send it to the students. All right, all right. I want to show you a little bit of an animation that one of my students made, but that's all right. Okay, uh, yearbook. Told you I couldn't talk for five minutes. Um, yearbook. So, yearbook is actually called Graphic Production 11 and 12. Um, and essentially, what it is is students working on creating the, the school's yearbook. Um, it's a fun course. The 11 level is where they are learning the, all the skills, all the tricks of the trade. Um, and then the, the 12 level is really where they become senior editors and they are, they're, or, they're more like entrepreneurs and they are running the course. I'm like the CEO, making sure things get done, making sure everyone has the skills they need. Um, but they're the, they're the ones that are organizing and it's like they're running a company. So it's a very different and unique course that way. Um, they take on roles of photographer, graphic artist, layout designer, manager, editors, etc., etc. I won't go on because, um, yeah, so I've already talked about the levels, so that's good. Why well, take this course? Um, some related careers, photographer, photojournalist, editor, graphic artist, entrepreneur, uh, printmaker, publisher, just to name a few. Um, and again, a lot of students find it, it's a reprieve from their academic courses. Um, they get to work on a real project that students are going to have for years to come. Um, so it means something to them. Uh, maybe it's someone whose goal is, I really want to immerse myself into school culture. I really want to make more friends. Um, and and that's, I, I see a lot of that too. And that's a great opportunity for, for them to do that. Um, see what it might be like to work as a magazine or newspaper, uh, sorry, to work for a magazine or newspaper as a photojournalist. So maybe it's an area, a career that they're thinking of and they want to see if, you know, this might be right for them. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know who's talking next. <laughs> uh, yeah? No? 
I don't have any final well, we, words we, other we than thank you for uh, coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, first, yeah. Do I hold this? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, just thank you for coming. Uh, you know, and showing some interest in your kids' concerns uh, or careers and photo stuff. It's neat to hear this elective stuff and hear the passion, right? And hopefully that will be passed on to your kids if they go that route. Uh, we're going to hang around a little bit, right, if you have any questions. Uh, again, your sons and daughters are hearing stuff in class. Uh, they're going to hear this stuff in their CLE or CLC block. Uh, uh, and I think it, you know, I, I put trust us, and I really do believe the process works, right? And if you use those sheets and just kind of mark off the courses you know you got to take, the process becomes a little simpler. Uh, I'm looking over what kids chose. I think we'll all, it all works out. It always does, right? Okay, so thank you very much for coming and showing an interest in your kids' future. Thank you, and thank you to my colleagues.